I'm so glad that you've tuned in to one of the sermons from St Mary's. If you're new to our church and would like to find out more about being involved, please visit our website and drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried out and were saved. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Good morning to you all here and at home and wherever you might be. As we continue to look, as Simon said, on the soul music of the Psalms, let's start with a prayer of approach from a prayer by Benedict of Nursia that's been used recently on Lectio 365. Let us pray. Gracious Father, give us the diligence to seek you and the wisdom to find you today. 
May our ears hear your voice, our eyes see your goodness, and our tongues proclaim your name as we commit our lives to pleasing you. Amen. A challenge for you. Hands up if you consider yourself honest. Or are you a liar, like so many Christians, including me? Let me be a bit more specific. When we meet friends and others, one of our first questions is, how are you? And the usual answer is, I'm fine, thanks. How are you? And while this might be true in many cases, how often, I wonder, do we bury our true feelings under our stiff upper lip? And why do we do this? Is it because, as Christians, we feel that we'll be letting the side down to admit to problems, doubts, fears, anxieties, and not to mention illness? Aren't we supposed to be full of peace, joy, and love all the time? Those of us who were here some 12 years ago will remember a Trinity student called Rico Villanueva from the Philippines, who was studying for his masters. He also played bass guitar in the band, uh, if you remember that too. But the subject of his thesis was the Lament Psalm, Psalms, of which Psalm 22 is a prime example. And if you'd like to read his research, it's published online and available on Kindle, entitled, It's Okay Not to Be Okay. And the book starts with the story of the typhoon Omdoi, where he was living at the time, which caused severe destruction to houses, villages, and lives in 2009. And the following week, he was preaching in a small church nearby. And the worship leader there pretended nothing had happened. There was no mention of Ondoy at all. Everything was as normal. They sang the same worship songs, said the same praises. And even the prayers mentioned nothing about the tragedy that had happened. Why was there nothing in the service about what they'd experienced? When I read the title for this sermon, I thought, oh, crumbs, how do I deal with that? When God seems far and darkness encroaches near, doesn't sound very inspiring, does it? But then I started reading and praying and about it and realized that the Bible is full of times when even those giants of faith had their moments of doubt, despair, anguish, and sorrow. Just as Hebrews 11 is a long list of those who, rec who were recognized for their faith in God, there are many places where those same people are sorely tested. And although he's not mentioned in Hebrews, one of the first people that came to mind is Elijah. In 1 Kings 18 and 19, we read how he goes from the supreme heights of defeating the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah on the top of Mount Carmel, straight into almost suicidal depression and despair when Jezebel threatens him. He ran for his life in fear of her, almost 90 miles, I gather, and even further until he stopped and there met God in a gentle whisper. Many of the Psalms, including this one today, were written by King David, whose life was very checkered from times when Saul was trying to kill him, even though he'd just defeated Goliath, to times when his son Absalom was trying to do the same. But he wasn't afraid to express his feelings honestly, both the downs and the ups. Compare the despair of this psalm with the peaceful confidence of the next one, Psalm 23. Psalm 22, although expressing how David was feeling when he wrote it, is also a messianic psalm with clear predictions about Jesus' death, as indeed and, and is quoted by him on the cross, as we heard in the reading. This psalm is quoted more times in the New Testament than any other one. And several of the circumstances that David describes were experienced by Jesus. Mocking insults in verses 7 and 8, the pierced hands and feet in verse 16, 
and the dividing of his clothes and casting lots for his garments in verse 18. Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, as Simon alluded, we can hear David on three levels. First, he speaks to his own suffering. Second, he speaks to Jesus' suffering. And third, he speaks about our suffering, the common suffering that all of us experience from one time or another. Despair, dejection, humiliation, hostility, pain, and death. Jesus suffered all these. As it says in Hebrews 4, he was tempted in every way, just as we are. One of the points that has been raised about this psalm that I hadn't spotted before was that the cry of desperation in verse 1 poses a theological question. Can Jesus the Son and the Father be separated as two parts of the Trinity or one God? And the answer that occurred to me was that even though Jesus was fully God, yes, he was also fully man. And it was as a man that he felt abandoned. Hence the cry, my God, my God, not my father, my father. The Gospels record that from noon to three in the afternoon, darkness came over the land, which is when Jesus cried out. Is it possible that when we are in a dark place, it's so dark, but we can't see God anymore. But while we might not be able to see him, there's no such thing as darkness to God. 1 John 1 reports that God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. As we read through the Old Testament, we can see how many times God's people seem to come to what looked like a dead end or a brick wall, as we saw on the slides. The crossing of the Red Sea with Pharaoh's army in hot pursuit crossing of the Jordan River to enter the promised land with, with Joshua, challenged by Goliath. Overwhelming forces de defeated by Gideon with just 300 men, the rest being sent home. Daniel in the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the fiery furnace. So hot that the soldiers that threw them in were killed. Need I go on? But God was there with them and rescues them. Indeed, the psalm ends in hope, and the last line is echoed by Jesus on the cross. It is finished. If you read any of the Gospels, you will see how close Jesus was to his Father at all times. He never did anything that the Father had not told him to. And in John 10, 30, Jesus states, I and the Father are one. Yet Jesus can feel abandoned by God. So if the giants of faith in the Old Testament and supremely Jesus himself can admit and acknowledge to not being okay, then there should be no reason why we shouldn't too when, it's, when that's how we feel. God doesn't promise to save us from life's challenges, but he does promise to be there with us. In John's Gospel, again, Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. John's gospel is a great source of comfort and encouragement. One of Jesus' other promises is, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. And what did Jesus say in the midst of the storm while crossing the Sea of Galilee when the terrified disciples woke him up? Peace, be still. And the wind and waves instantly calmed down. When you're not feeling okay, notice I say when, not if, can I encourage you to be honest with yourselves and with your friends and admit it? Jesus did, so can we. And those of us who are privileged to be confided in must encourage and comfort, knowing our turn will come. In my own case, I know that when my late wife Judy was in the last stages of her illness and I felt overwhelmed and totally unable to pray, I just had to pick up the phone to Mary Burkitt and say, please pray. That was all, and put the phone down. 
Within 10 minutes, I could feel it as she triggered the prayer chain. I know there are people here who are desperate, and there will be others that I don't know about. If that refers to you, please seek out someone to speak to and pray with. Don't leave this morning without sharing your burden. And I would encourage you all to remember that when you're in similar circumstances, when you were in similar circumstances, and the comfort that I hope you received then, let's be more open with each other as we remember that it is okay not to be okay sometimes. And I close with a reading from a, a short story that many of you will have heard at funerals. But let's not wait until a funeral to realize that it's true. One night, I dreamed I was walking along the beach with the Lord. Many scenes in my life flashed before me. In the sky. In each scene, I noticed footsteps in the sand. Sometimes there were two sets of footprints. Other times, there was only one. This bothered me because I noticed that during the low periods of my life, when I was suffering from anguish, sorrow and defeat, I could only see one set of footprints. So I said to the Lord, you promised me, Lord, that if I followed you, you would walk with me always. But I noticed that during the most trying periods of my life, there was only one set of prints in the sand. Why, when I needed you most, have you not been there for me? The Lord replied, the times when you could only see one set of prints, it was then that I carried you. Amen.